Welcome to another message from Bridge Assembly, located at 725 Granite Avenue in Helena, Montana. For more information on Bridge, go to our website at bridgehelena.com. It is our prayer that this message will help you to connect with God, connect with others, and connect others with God. Hallelujah. We don't just say hallelujah, do we? We scream hallelujah. We shout hallelujah. Because God is the God above all things. And God truly loves each one of us. Now there's heavy hearts here today. My heart is breaking for some of the families in here today. The Strongs, the Sapalas, the Hearts. Over the last several weeks, there's been losses. And the devil will take that and he will try to throw it in our face. It will cause us to, to get angry and, and frustrated and, and depressed. But what we have to remember is that we can scream hallelujah even at our lowest moments. Even at the very bottom times of our life, we can always scream out the name of Jesus and shout out hallelujah and call upon the name of the Lord. He is the constant comforter. He is the one who loves you beyond measure. He is the one that gathers you to himself so that he may dote on you, that he may minister to you, that he may extend his compassion in the times that are so desperately hard. So this morning in this house, we will shout hallelujah and praise to our Lord. Even though the times may be tough, even though the sorrow may be at hand, we will scream out the name of Jesus and proclaim our Lord over our life, over our family's life, and over this community. Amen. Can we do the front part of that song again? That's such a proclamation. Father God, we are here for no other reason than you yourself. God, we lay ourselves aside. We move away from our selfish agendas and, and all of those things that get in the way of our relationship with you. Lord, we, we lay those at the altar. Just get them out of our sight as we focus upon you, Lord. Father, we thank you so much for the entire history of mankind from Adam to the babies that are being born right now. Lord God, we thank you that you were involved in every millisecond of that history. And your plan, Lord God, was the right plan. And your plan is the plan that we hold on to. Lord God, sending your only son. Lord God, how tragic is that? That you had to send your only son. But Lord God, it was out of your love that you did this. Because you love us so, so very much. And in return, Lord God, all that we can offer you is our, our heart. It's offer you is our life. Lord God, it seems so small compared to what you've done for us. But you take that. And, and with joy, you begin to shape us. You begin to change us. You begin to mold us into the person who you created us to be. Lord, we thank you so much for that. Jesus, everything that you actively do in our life, the day to day that you, that you speak to us, that you walk with us, Jesus, you our our everything. You are our Lord, you are our Savior, but you are our friend, you are our companion, Jesus. We thank you that you that you seek us out and you come to us in our in our times of heartbreak, in our times of trouble, in our times of sorrow, in our times of confusion. Lord, you are always there. You are never apart from us. You are always walking with us. And Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, we thank you so much for your action within our lives. You are the comforter. You are the counselor. You are 
the active portion of God that we deal with on an everyday. So Holy Spirit, we ask, Lord God, for wisdom. We ask for humility. We ask for conviction. But Lord God, today, give a, give a double dose of comfort. Your ways are much higher than our ways. Your understanding is much higher than our understanding. We don't get it. But we know that we can come to you and ask why. And Lord God, in that place, you begin to reveal yourself to us even more. Jesus, those that are experiencing loss, those that are away today, those that are out of town, those that are ill, whatever it is, Lord God, we are one body under the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Jesus, we love you. We scream hallelujah from the mountaintops. We also scream hallelujah from the valleys. We pray this in the mighty name of King Jesus, our Savior. And everyone said, Amen. You guys be seated. Mm. What a great time of worship. I'll be honest with you, I miss that so much. I hope nobody is listening from the church that we attended. It's a great church. It's awesome. But I'm telling you what, this church knows how to worship. This church knows how to worship. So to walk back in here this morning and to just be suffocated by the worship of this church is so amazing. Um, we don't have a whole lot of kids today, do we? Um, do we only have one kid? Is that our kid? You got, we can, we don't have to. Uh-oh, Bruce has got something planned. Um, all right, kids are dismissed. How about that? All right. <laughs> Thank you. A few quick announcements. Gosh, I'm not the right one to be giving announcements. I have no idea what's going on. Just got back Friday evening. But um, I know there's a few things. Mainly it's the Symphony Under the Stars. We've been doing this for really as long as I've been here. Um, and it's a great time. We just go and, and, yeah, the music is sometimes great, sometimes not that great. But what it is, is it's fellowship and community. So so Bridge will have their area. We always have our, our area. Um, but what we need is a head count. We need to know how many people are coming so we know how much to um, grab, stake out, homestead, parcel off, whatever. So what we need you to do is register for this, and that's easy. You just get on our new app. If, how many of you guys have the app? A lot of you guys have the app. If you don't have the app, John will help you get the app. And if you're like, well, that's a little bit over my level, is this app stuff, just tell John, hey, I'm coming to the Symphony Under the Stars. Put me in there. But the app is, is amazing. It just keeps growing. You can get to our services on the app, giving on the app, calendar on the app, um, prayer. If you need prayer, you can do it on the app. The app is amazing, so please get that. But Symphony Under the Stars, that's this Friday. Starts at 6, correct? Wait, no, what day is it? I don't know. I've been gone. Let's flip that slide back. It's Saturday, but on Friday, we need runners. You guys know what runners are? Because they all line up, and then they say, go, and you got to run down and stake out your spot. So I think you get there at noon? Three. What time, John? 12 to 3 to save our place in line. And then John, John like in his flip-flop sprints down. It's like he leads the pack. In some ways it looks like a gazelle being chased by a cheetah, but it makes him go faster. So if you would be willing to just go hang out Friday, again, another fellowship time and, and all that, um, Please talk to John about all of that. Um, I talked about the app. Prayer prayer walk this week is around Capitol High, correct? Capitol High. So that's our prayer emphasis. We know how terribly bad that our schools need prayer. Our public schools, they're kind of a mess. They need prayer. So, so gather 
pray on your own or get with the group, all that. Um, it's marked out on the, the map out there like we've always been doing, but let's, let's just do that. Um, I think that's announcements. I really don't know. I haven't been in the office. Four ways to give. Actually, now we kind of have five because we have the app, but that's kind of online. So online Bridge Helena, you can do the app, you can text, you can do the giving boxes in the back in the envelopes. You can mail it. Uh, your tithe is your tithe, right? That's your 10%. That just goes to your church. Um, but an offering, you can designate and say, hey, I want my offering to go to this. Missions or youth or kids or, or whatever that is. We, we know that God loves a joyful giver. Um, so please just listen. Listen to what he is speaking to you. But even more so, if, you, if you're kind of leery about this whole giving thing, I would challenge you guys to do like a Bible study on giving. What does the Bible say about giving? Is it really that necessary? Um, the Bible will not mislead you, will it? We're going to talk about that today. Um, so I would encourage you to do that. You guys ready to get rolling? Man, after two weeks out of the pulpit, it's like, I'm ready to get rolling. I, I am horrible at sitting in church. I realized that this, I went to this. It was a great church. It really was. And, and I listened, and it was hard to sit and listen. And, and that's so not like me in my prior life. I was the last one that would get up and speak, right? That just wasn't me. But, but now it's not me to just sit and listen. It's like, yeah, but, but you missed this part, and you could have added this part. And I wasn't critiquing or anything, but man, the God, God just stirs in me. I, I, I want to be up here. I, I need to be up here. So thank you for coming this morning. Um, let's pray. And then we'll get started. Father, Lord, once again, we thank you that we can walk into your house this morning, Lord God. And, and we thank you that we can walk into this house this morning. Because, Lord God, this is your building. Your church enters your building. And with the church entering the building, so comes a, a spirit of praise, Lord God, a spirit of, of worship. So, Lord God, help us to continue to, to do that. Not just here on a Sunday morning, but let your church fill this community with your worship. Holy Spirit, allow me to speak those things that you have, have, have illuminated to me, that you have shown me. And Lord God, if it's not of you, Holy Spirit, take it out of my mouth. And once again, Lord, don't let anybody leave here today the same way they walked in. Lord, if they walked in brokenhearted, let them leave full of your love, still sorrowful. But Lord God, not brokenhearted, because Lord, we know the rest of the story. We know the rest of the story. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. And once again, everyone said, Amen. Amen. Hey, there's one other thing I want to throw out here. Um, and I'll be throwing this out the next few Sundays. Summers are always hard in Montana because um, it's hit or miss on who's here on Sunday mornings. But, but if I give it several, hopefully we'll, we'll get it a lot. We, we need people to serve, right? This is a church. We need, we need volunteer people to serve. And, and several of those areas that we vitally need are, are sound, right? Um, video and, and then the Facebook stuff. And I could say, if, if that is your gifting, would you please consider serving? But more so, I would say, if, if you have a heart to serve, if you have a desire to plug into this church at a, at a deeper level, I, I would say, get a hold of me. Um, we can train you guys. Don't be like, oh my gosh, I could never run sound. I bet you could. Oh my gosh, video, that computer stuff, it's so hard to look at a side and click. Yeah, that's, that's pretty hard. We can train you. Facebook Live, it's, it's easy. That, that one, you get a lot of great comments if it drops, not by our fault, but the Internet's fault. I know, you've got to have thicker skin to do Facebook Live. But some of you guys have some really thick skin. So I would say, please pray about it and consider getting involved. There, there's... Um, we need more instrumentalists, guitar players, bass. The what? Yes. If you're interested in any of this, holler at me. We will plan a night out. You can get more information if you're interested in any part of, of uh, really the Sunday morning component of, of, of church. Um, please do. 
All right, with that being said, let's get started. And once again, I want to say that, that we are <laughs> we are so glad to be back. At least I'm speaking for myself. I hope Amy is is glad to be back as, as well. We had we had a good time being gone, but my goodness, we missed you guys. We missed our family, right? We were visiting family, but that's different. You're our church family, and and uh, I I personally, like I said, missed being in church. This church, I missed being in this church on a on a Sunday on a Sunday morning. And and while we were gone, the church we attended, um, it's this church that sits in the middle of nowhere. It really does. Um, there's a there's a road, you know. It's not so much in Montana, but in Kansas, it's like you don't call a road by its official name. You call it by the Green Randolph Road, right? So this church sits in between a town of Green, which has a whopping population of probably maybe 100 people. Maybe on a good day, if everybody's there, there's 100 people in this town. And then on the other end of the Green Randolph Road would be Mike, you are on it. I'm so glad you're paying attention. Randolph, and Randolph's a bigger city. It probably has like 400 people, right? And, and, and there's maybe 20 miles, Green Randolph Road, and kind of right in the middle of it is this Alert Covenant Church. And, and it sits on 80 acres from like the late 1800s. It's been there and they've had this acreage. And, and it's just a, an interesting church. It's a thriving church in the middle of nowhere. And, and God really showed me some stuff about that. Um, and it was so good to see people that, that we know right? Because we were in that community for a long time. That, that, that little church supported us the entire time we were missionaries, and they were very faithful in that. So it was great to see the people we know, and, and uh, it was just good to, to be there, but it wasn't the same. It just wasn't the same as, as being here. And, and having that time away, attending that church, and just being away from this church, away from this community, and being so far removed, I had, I had a lot of time to, to think and to ponder and to, to pray. And, and having that time away, God allows me to observe different things, right? Not to say, oh, we need to do that or we shouldn't do that. I just observed different things, and, and I did. And I remember one day, one day we were driving, and, and we were out on a, on a smaller back road of, of Kansas, which honestly is so beautiful this time of year because you have the, the deep green corn, right? The corn's pretty high, high as an elephant's eye on the 4th of July, right? Wasn't quite that high, but with the rains coming, it's, it's getting that high, but it's this deep, deep green. And, and the, the wheat fields, they were harvesting, so the amber wheat fields. So you got green and you got wheat. It was, it was really, really pretty. And, and as we were driving, uh, I noticed things, so I said to Amy, I said, hey, Amy, it's so weird to look out while we drive and not see any mountains. That's just weird. See, what I have become accustomed to was noticeably lacking. Yet, for those who live in Kansas, they didn't give it a second thought. They probably looked at me and they're like, what is he doing? And I'm like, where are the mountains at? To them, it's normal. They don't expect to see mountains. But because I have lived in Montana for six years now, in Helena, in the valley, in a bowl, there's mountains on every single side. It was just a, a, a little weird. So today I want to talk about our, and more specifically your, point of view. And we just spent a lot of time a lot of time going through the book of 1 John. And, and there's an incredible amount of information and teaching in that book that is so relevant for us today. And, and not only that, the entire Bible has been given to us to both challenge our thinking as well as to point us to the truth and where we can place our measure of faith in. See, how we choose to look at the Bible matters. I mean, you guys in here believe that. How we choose to look at the Bible, it's imperative. It, it matters in our faith, in our existence in this world. So this morning is all about our point of view. Because in our life, in our day-to-day, -day, we need to frequently consult the Word of God in order to gain and maintain a proper perspective, it's, a, it's 
So many weird things happen in a day to day. I mean, think about it. From the time you get up to the time you go to bed, how many things are just like, boy, that was different. That was kind of weird. That was kind of mm, not so good. Oh, that was glorious. But we need to take all of those things and filter them through something. Now, perspective is what, what we're talking about today. And, and uh, we need to keep that proper perspective on a daily basis. Perspective we could define um, as the, the state of one's ideas and the facts known to one in order to evaluate all data and relationships. So our per perspective helps us to evaluate the data in our life, but also the relationship of that data or, or even the people within our lives, right? We need to be, be um, looking at that and having a proper perspective in our relationships. My perspective is really what I process my life through. And that can be so many different things. So my perspective is absolutely dependent by my point of view. See, if I stand over here, I get a whole different perspective. Whoa, Mark. Wow. I see you. I see you differently. You're unobstructed. But if I come over here, my perspective is much different. It's like, oh, Mark, you're behind people. Where'd you go? It's just different. So where I'm standing, where, I'm, where I am positioning myself can greatly change my perspective. Look at Colossians 3.2. Set your mind and keep focused habitually on the things above, the heavenly things, not with the things that are on the earth which have only temporal value. The question becomes not only what do you think, but also how do you think? Starting as a newborn baby, we are immediately bombarded with teachings on how to think. And throughout our lifetime, there are countless influences, positive and negative, upon our thought process. Right now, you are being challenged, hopefully, in your thought process about something. When you leave here today, the rest of the day, you will be challenged on your current thought process. Tomorrow, you're going to read an article. You're going to look at social media, and it's going to try to affect your current thought process, your perspective. Now, thank God we have a source we can always depend upon that is relevant in every single situation we will ever find ourselves in. So that we can, like the last verse said, set our mind and keep focused habitually on the things above. In your Bibles, flip over to 2 Timothy. We're going to look at uh, 3.16 and 17. All Scripture is God-breathed given by divine inspiration and is profitable for instruction, for conviction of sin, for correction of error and restoration to obedience, for training in righteousness, learning to live in conformity to God's will, both publicly and privately, behaving honorably with personal integrity and moral courage so that the man of God may be complete and proficient, outfitted and thoroughly equipped for every good work. What an amazing passage of Scripture right there. All of those things are available to us. So this verse right here tells us we can, in terms of our faith, have confidence in the truth and teachings that we find in Scripture. I would go as far as saying that we not only can, but we should. Because there's always a difference between ideas and application, isn't there? Yeah, there is. Between theology and action. Between word and deed. The Second Timothy tells us that we can, but we have to decide if we do. I love that part of God's economy and His plan. He doesn't make us robots. He gives us the information. He gives us the leading. He gives us everything that we need to follow Him. But then we have to make the choice to actually follow Him. He gives us the Bible, the inherent Word of God, that we can trust in. Not only do we need to know that, we have to actually apply that 
into our lives. So today is merely a challenge to evaluate or reevaluate your views and your thought process, your perspective. And I'm not going to tell you how to think. I, I don't like it when people try to tell me how to think because someone being told to do something rarely induces a change, right? I so wish it did. I wish I could just say, hey, you should do this. And people were just like, man, I'll do it. Get to church on Sunday. Fine! I'll do it! And our church is full. <laughs> but me telling somebody, anybody telling you to do something, it doesn't always induce the change that, that you would like it to. Rather, if we come to a place where we can question ourselves, we can then discern where we are at. See, if unless we're asking questions, we don't really know where we're at, do we? That's why Jesus was always asking questions to people. People would come with a question and Jesus would answer with a question. That's like, Jesus, I just need to answer. No, I'm not going to tell you. I'm going to, I'm going to help, help you. I'm going to invite you into this process so that you can figure this out. And then you'll know where you are. And then you can choose to change or choose to dig in your heels. See, when we have a known reference point, we can then build upon that perspective either to confirm our beliefs or to question our beliefs. This is, this is really the normal process for all people from, from children on up. But it can be extremely important when it comes to our faith and how we employ our faith into our everyday lives. Because your faith, your faith is just that. Your faith is your faith. Your faith is not my faith. My faith is not your faith. Your faith is not the faith of your parents or your grandparents. Your faith is not the faith of your friends and neighbors. Your faith is your own faith. And you need to determine how that will look by establishing the correct perspective and questioning those things that are within your life. What you believe will be determined by you, yourself. As one who has chosen to believe in Christ, do you also believe what 2 Timothy 3.16 and 3.17 affirms? It's a question you've got to ask. It. Man, I'm all about Christianity. Man, Jesus was the guy. I like this idea of going to heaven. I would even call myself born again, but I'm not sure that everything in the Bible is iner inherent. Inerrant. I don't know that the, the, the whole book is inspired. See, your perspective needs to be questioned upon that. And in so doing, do you trust and reply, rely upon, upon God's Word, the Bible, for your everyday life. For every single situation, do you rely upon the Word of God? Or do you look to the world or other teachings or experiences or just somewhere else for answers? They're questions we've got to ask ourselves. And we don't segregate that simply for, oh, I do on Sunday morning, but you don't understand where I work on Monday is totally different. So I have to adopt a whole other set of rules or standards. So I have my, my church perspective, and then I have my everyday perspective. How can you have two different perspectives? If you have two different perspectives, it's going to make you go cross-eyed, right? When we're cross-eyed, everything gets blurry. Go, go outside and, and walk along the wall right out here with your eyes crossed. See what happens. It causes a lot of pain, right? Got to have a sole singular perspective. Look at Romans 12, 2. And do not be conformed to this world any longer with its superficial values and customs. Does our world today have any superficial values or customs? Yeah, all of them. But be transformed and progressively changed as you mature spiritually by the renewing of your mind, focusing on godly values and ethical attitudes. This so that you may prove for yourselves what the will of God is. That which is good and acceptable and perfect in His plan and purpose for your life. I, I like that part. So that you may prove for yourselves. You're not proving this to anybody else. You're proving it to yourselves. 
Again, I can't tell others what to think, but I can determine what I think. I can prove these things to myself, which then can help me have conversations with each other. It would be so easy if we just shared the gospel with somebody and they were sold out, converted on the spot. Hardcore Christian. But it doesn't happen because they have to figure it out on their own. The same things that I have hopefully figured out and continue to figure out in my own life. Now, I will admit that all of this today really stems from a survey I read that, that just came out last May. Just a couple months ago, this, this survey came out. And at first, I was pretty speechless, to be honest with you, as, as dumbfounded by the, by the results. Here's, here's an excerpt of that study. A nationwide survey of about 1,000 Christian pastors found that just slightly more than a third, 37% of the U.S. pastors hold a biblical worldview. The majority, 62%, possess a hybrid worldview known as syncretism. Now, syncretism, that is the, the blending or attempted blending of, of different religions, different cultural norms or schools schools of thought, different philosophies. We just, we just grab that and we kind of blend it all together and we come up with something that, that we want to believe in. People do that all the time. But this survey is focused upon pastors. It continues to say this. The study released Thursday showed that 41% of senior pastors, well, that's still pretty bad, as compared to 28% of associate pastors have a biblical worldview. Further, only 13% of teaching pastors, only 13% of teaching pastors, and 12% of children and youth pastors have a biblical worldview. The lowest level of biblical worldview was among executive pastors. Now, if you don't know what an executive pastor is, an executive pastor is, is a pastor on staff that really takes care of a lot of the business side of the church, right? Finances, um, scheduling. It's like, it's like that. that frees the lead pastor up for... I don't have an executive pastor, so I'm all confused on here. What's my biblical view? I fall under... I'm teaching pastor? I'm a lead pastor? I guess I'm an executive pastor. Do I average those things? But with among executive pastors, they only have a 4% belief, biblical belief. They only hold consistently with biblical beliefs and behaviors. Only 4% of them do that. Your, your mouth should be hanging open right now. See, when I, when I read this, I was troubled. I was distraught in my spirit. I was sorrowful, but I was angry, and, and I'm still frustrated. See, I'm troubled that those walking into a church for the very first time, not knowing anything about Jesus, not knowing anything about the, the Bible, have a 62% chance of not finding the truth in America. I am disgusted that 62% of professing Christians are sitting under the authority and teaching of a pastor who doesn't hold a biblical perspective or worldview. That disgusts me. What are you guys talking about? What damage are you doing? It's like, don't try to help anymore. Separate yourself. We have a hard enough time being biblical, holding to biblical truths, and then you have all these pastors that are not and it's not that they're just not doing it, it's just what they're preaching is in error. Far too many people today, and this includes those who call themselves Christians, are allowing themselves to believe whatever they themselves determine to be true. Blending Christianity with other religions, philosophies, and current culture and social norms, and making themselves this 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 belief smoothie because I like this part. Don't really like that part. That's too hard to hear. But oh, I like this over here. Oh, I, I I like this. Oh, this allows me to participate in this sin. Oh, I'll throw that in there and I'll hit mix up. I'll drink that down and that will be my belief system, totally alienating the truth of God. 
another Barna study that was released about a year ago showed though 51% of American adults say they have a biblical worldview. Only 6% of American adults actually do. 6% of, an, of American adults actually have a worldview. And we wonder why our country is the way it is. We wonder why politics are the way it is. We wonder why, why businesses do the things that they do. Right? We wonder why our churches are a mess, warring with each other. We're watching full denominations, scandal after scandal falling. We're watching other de denominations saying, you know what, we want to embrace this. We're watching it. It's a train wreck and it's happening right in front of us. And we can look at this study and say, well, duh, 6%, only 6% have a biblical worldview. Truth has been made subjective in the belief that if it works for me, man, you do you. You do you. That doesn't hurt anything. Man, I'll believe what I want to believe and you believe what you want to believe and we'll just all get along. We'll coexist perfectly. Except for those guys that have the biblical worldview. Because they say our worldview is wrong, so they must be wrong. But let's all just make our own little smoothie here and, and be happy. See, this is expected from the world. I would fully expect this from the world. This is not the way of the church. And the subjection of truth absolutely does not belong in the pulpit. For the Christian, we have three incredible tools that God has granted us. He's bestowed upon us gifts to determine what we believe. It's the Bible. It's the Holy Spirit. And it's our brain. We can engage our brain. Our brain helps us to say, no, go to the Bible. The Holy Spirit says, I will illuminate that Bible for you. I will illuminate the truth that is contained in this Bible. This is how we form where we choose to pursue a biblical perspective. So why does it matter? Why does this even matter and does it? Am I making a big deal out of nothing? Well, it matters because without the foundational anchor of truth in our lives, we are destined to be ruled by emotion, fear, selfish desires, and sin. If we don't have that biblical foundation, man, we're stuck. We're over here. We're, we're in a raging sea of, of emotion. I don't want to be there. I don't want to live in fear. My selfish desires, man, they're going to trample over everyone else. And sin... Man, sin is so incredibly powerful. We don't understand how powerful the bondage of sin actually is. Now, on the other hand, when you have a biblical perspective, you place yourself under the covering, the guidance, and the authority of God Himself. How many of you guys want to be under that spot? Oh, buddy, I do. See, our worldview, our decision-making, how we choose to live, how we approach situations, our interaction with others, our conduct, our ethical outlook is governed by the principles, morals, and teachings that we find in the Bible in God's Word. At least that's the plan. At least that's how it should be. But 94% of professing American Christians, they don't have that. Understand that God's wisdom is so far beyond our own. We can't even come close to, to, to understanding the wisdom of God. Yet we can be led by His wisdom when we believe the Bible to be the authoritative, inspired, and inerrant truth that God has gifted us. When we have a biblical perspective we really do have a dual perspective. Because we have all had a pre-Christian or pre-biblical worldview at one time in our lives, right? Because we know how salvation works. We are born into sin and then we have to choose God. We have to be born again. We have to choose His ways. Well, everything before that wonderful time in our life when we submit ourselves to the Lord, we have had a pre-biblical worldview. See, that was 
It's just how you looked at things before Christ was in your life. And we can remember that perspective. To me, it feels like a a distant memory. It almost feels like somebody else. But we can remember that perspective. And and now that we have been born into the kingdom of God, our new God-centered, truth-filled perspective allows us to see how messed up that we once were. Look at Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. And you are dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, that's Satan, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. That was our worldview at one time. What I used to think was right, I now know is wrong because I no longer rely upon my own reasoning, but I seek the truth of God revealed in His Scriptures and by the Holy Spirit. The Bible doesn't necessarily tell us what to think as much as it gives us the foundation of our thought process. That's a really big thing, and that's a really big mistake that people make. Well, the Bible said I should do this. The Bible said I shouldn't do this. But there's this big gray area in there. It doesn't really say either way. That's because you're, you're looking to the Bible to say, okay, tell me exactly what to think. And you're missing out on this beautiful concept called a thought process. A biblical worldview is a biblical thought process. My perspective becomes biblical in practice, right? It's just my default. I'm going to default back into believing what the Bible says and trying to follow the truths of that teaching. It's the theology and the doctrine and those teachings, those are the filters that I now use. In this respect, even though I may not be able to find that specific answer as to how to handle a specific situation or viewpoint, my overall biblical guide, it guides me in biblical truth. For, For example, you can look through the Scriptures, and the Scriptures say nothing specifically about protecting myself from those things I can find on the Internet. You know why it doesn't? Because the internet wasn't invented yet. So when the Bible was written, they couldn't talk about the internet. It wasn't there. But if I search in there and say, oh, I like to get on the internet. I like to get on certain websites and look at certain things. The Bible says, I, it doesn't specifically say I can't. But I look at the greater picture because I'm not just being told what to think. I'm using a thought process. And the principles that I find in Scripture guide me in such a way that allow me to apply God's truth in my biblical perspective to every situation that I'm going to face. I know right from wrong. Look at Colossians 2.8. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy or empty deception, pseudo-intellectual babble. (laughs) That's popular today according to the tradition and musings of mere men, following the elementary principles of this world, rather than following the truth, the teachings of Christ. we we got to understand that, that everyone's perspective, those that are sold out born-again Christians, those that are churchgoers, those that are worldly, atheists, false people who follow false religions, everyone's perspective or view is going to be filtered by something. Now, if you have a mathematical view, you filter everything through an analytical way, right? It, no, everything's got to equal this plus this. It has to equal this. If it doesn't, there's something wrong. I'm very analytical about that, which, which at its essence, I would argue, actually backs the Bible up with a scientific view. Like, I'm talking about like real science here. I'm not talking about like, like pseudoscience that we see in the media or in politics. This is, this is like real science. It's, it's, it's a view based upon experimentation and study 
in order to seek and to find the facts, right? That, that would be a scientific viewpoint, which, which again, I would argue, supports the Bible. You could have a purely worldview that filters everything through current cultural trends and social norms, right? You could, you could have that. And this is very popular right now. This is a very popular right now. It is so popular right now to the extent that it overrides basic human biology. See, a cultural worldview attests that a baby is not a baby, but a man can be a woman. How does that add up? But that's the worldview. That's the, that's the cultural worldview that so many people are attached to today. One can have a worldview based upon fear or past hurts or addiction. How about a worldview perspective that is based upon and filtered through sin? See, if we're not filtering our worldview through the Bible, we're filtering it through sin, which is the, it is the primary influence on all worldviews and perspectives that are absent of God's truth. And then, of course, there is the Bible or a biblical worldview. And remember that the decisions we make are influenced, even governed by the, the view we pursue. So now we come to Colossians 3.17. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. So the question for you today, the question for us today what perspective are you filtering your life in this world through? A biblical worldview is the Christ-centered view. You have to understand that. You can't separate the two. You can't separate the two because, because everything that Jesus said is backed up by the Bible. The Bible backs up everything that Jesus said. And the Holy Spirit will never contradict what the Bible says. The Bible will never contradict what the Holy Spirit says. See, the attributes of the Father are, are the words. And they are the actions of the Son. By and through the Holy Spirit, the Bible is inspired. And He, he, he being the Holy Spirit, illuminates the Scriptures to us. Remember before you were a Christian and somebody would say, you, you got to read the Bible and your answer was always the same. That doesn't make no sense. I try to read it. All this begats and vows and I just, I don't know what's going on. Do you start at the beginning or do you start part? Some people tell me, to, what book do you start part way through? I don't understand anything about the Bible, but then Christ comes into our lives. The Holy Spirit enters us. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And, and in that, the Holy Spirit says, hey, I'm going to help illuminate this Scripture. Sometimes that happens before we even come to Jesus, though, doesn't it? It's like people get so down. Man, they open up a Bible in a motel room, sent there by the Gideons. And something in there makes sense. Not by their own intelligence by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He, he, he illuminates the Scriptures to us. We take all that into account. And we think, man, I've got to be a born-again believer with a biblical worldview, trusting in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All of those things come together. I think I'm, I'm pretty, pretty set. But, but now this is really important right here. A biblical worldview guides us with its moral compass. Biblical worldview helps us to understand what's right and wrong, correct? We've just been talking about that. So now we understand why things like abortion, sexual deviation, and, and true identity are either right or wrong based upon God's absolute truth. And also, and listen close here, and also, a biblical worldview guides us in our interaction with others. That's the part we got to understand right there. A biblical worldview guides us in our interaction with others. Biblical worldview helps us to ask the question and, and seek the answer, how did Jesus treat others? What is his message? What is, does, what is his desire for every person? 
We have to remember those things because it's really easy to claim we have a biblical worldview and to set ourselves apart from everybody on a pedestal. You peasants don't know the wisdom that I have because I have a biblical worldview. I am right, you are wrong. But having a biblical worldview, see, it's not a, a divisive weapon to, to, to condemn the world. But having a biblical worldview is a Holy Spirit empowerment to live out the greats. The great commandment and the great commission. A biblical worldview sets us apart from the world, right? It absolutely does. But it will not seclude us from our neighbor and fellow man who needs Jesus in their life. We have to understand that. We cannot use a biblical worldview as an excuse to trample on people or to segregate ourselves from the world. As for this church, us as a body, we choose and we will diligently pursue and profess a biblical worldview. You have my word on that one. We will use the truth we find in Scripture and apply it to current cultural trends and never the other way around. We will pull context out of this book. We will not try to put context into this book. That's not a biblical worldview when we're saying, oh, but what the Bible really says, and I can use these three words as an example to, to uh, support my opinion on you fill in the blank. We're not, we're not going to do that here. That's my affirmation to you. To you as the body as well as to this world as the pastor and the shepherd of Bridge Assembled. And as a body of believers, the, the church that meets in this building, can we agree that anyone who walks through those front doors for the first time or the 10,000th time will find a community and culture of truth and love? Can we agree to that? Can we really jump headlong into that? We will accept any sinner that walks through the door, but we will not condone their sin. We will work in truth and love to set them free from that sin through the power and the authority of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. See, those are the biblical principles that we will stand upon. Worship team, if you guys want to come up. As a church, that's what I'm declaring. But now as individuals, how about you in your individual life? What will you choose to do? How will you choose to live your life outside of this church? Right? Being gone, I got, you know, I thank God the church was like, man, we're leaving him alone. Almost too much in a way, but they wanted me to refresh and recharge, and I thank each and every one of you from that. But, I, you know, I did get messages, and there was two tragic things, two, two losses that happened just while we were gone. And that's hard, and that's, that's difficult, and, and sometimes it's hard to, to make rhyme or reason out of that. But I'll tell you this, a biblical perspective sure puts things in order. Biblical perspective tells us that God is a loving God. That God holds the, 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 the sorrow, the tears of His people within His hands. So this morning as we end, we're going to sing Breathe. It's a good, solid, lots about God's Word. I, I'm going to invite you. If you're in here this morning and you're suffering heartbreak, loss, whatever it may look like. If, if, you're, if you're experiencing tragedy right now, I would invite you to come forward and, and, and stake yourself to the attributes of God that we find in the Bible and through our biblical perspective. And I would also invite others who have maybe strayed from their biblical perspective you want to affirm you have a biblical perspective or reaffirm 
that you have a biblical perspective, I, I would invite you to the altar because remember, it's about you and God. It's about you determining what you want to believe. You don't have to come to me and tell me. You can't. But what you need to do is get to go to God. Affirm or reaffirm that statement. God, I am choosing to believe in you. I'm choosing to believe in your word. I'm choosing to allow the Holy Spirit to illuminate, to convict me in all of those things. I am stepping away from this world and its perspective, but I am stepping into your perspective about this world. So if you're sorrowful, you're going through tragedy, or you just need to reaffirm your stance as a believer, a follower of Christ, I would encourage you to take this time to do just that. If we could all stand up, I am going to pray. We're going to start the song, and the altar will be open. Father, Lord, we have all of us in times of our life made the error of losing our biblical perspective, of, of trying to manipulate the Bible to fit our own desires and our own agenda. Lord God, we, we ask for your forgiveness of that. We repent of that. And in so doing, we turn to your Bible. Lord, let the Bible be not, be not the dusty book on our shelf. Let it be the worn out, stained up book that I carry everywhere and go to. Let that be my first source. And Holy Spirit, we continue to ask that you illuminate these words so that every time I get into the Bible, it is fresh and new with the familiarity of something that's been in my life for so long. Lord, help me not to stray from that. And Lord, if if those are going through tragedy, heartbreak right now, Lord, let them be surrounded by the church and comforted. But even more, let them trust in the truth of your word and every attribute that it attests to. Jesus, we ask this in your name. Now there's two types of people that are lost. Those who know they're lost and those who have no idea they're lost. But without God, without the truth of his word, we are truly lost. It's it's wisdom to understand how lost we are without that. Let me pray for you guys, and then I'll dismiss you guys. Father, Lord, as everyone goes out today, Lord God, let them not be the same. Let them question the things within their life. Because, Lord God, through our questioning comes your wisdom. So, Lord God, bless and protect. Lord God, provide and lead each person here today. And those that are away, those that are online, Lord God, touch each one of us. We long for you, and we have a longing for your word. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. This concludes today's message. We hope you can join us next Sunday for services beginning at 10 o'clock a.m. at Bridge Assembly located at 725 Granite Avenue in Helena, Montana. For more information about Bridge Assembly, go to bridgehelena.com. And we hope you can join us next Sunday with Pastor Jason Metz.